So in our previous videos, we've had a look at how a mass spectrometer worked and some calculations we might be expected to do alongside our understanding of mass spectrometer. What we're going to look at now is what the result of a mass spectrometer um, sample being analysed is and how we can interpret it. So what we get from our mass spectrometer is a, like a graph. We call this the spectrum. And along the bottom, we've got something here that is mass divided by charge the mass to charge ratio okay so it's mass over charge now given that all of our um, ions are given a plus one charge we hope so 99.9% .9 of the time the charge of the ion is plus one if you take any number and divide it by plus one you will just get the mass itself so the numbers along the bottom are generally just going to be the mass. Up the side, we've got percentage abundance. So remember that when the sample hit our detector, it generated a current. And the bigger the current, the bigger the abundance was. So we can see here that this particular peak at, at a mass to charge ratio of 24 was 84% of our sample. So that it was much more abundant than everything else. And, it, and these are percentages, so we know that these numbers will add up to 100. And they are our sample. So what can we tell from this? It's a mass spectrum of magnesium. What information could we get from it? Have a think about that. What is it telling us? So the first question I would ask you is, how many isotopes are there of magnesium? Remember that isotopes are atoms of the same element with a different mass number. So how many isotopes are there of magnesium? And so we can see that we've got three peaks. So there are three isotopes of magnesium. And those isotopes are 24 mg, 25 mg, and 26 mg. We've got those three isotopes of magnesium. What else can we see from that? Which of the isotopes is most abundant in our sample? We can see that 24 mg is the most abundant. We've got most of that. So in a sample of 100 magnesium atoms, what this is saying to us is that 84 of the magnesium atoms have an isotopic mass of 24, 7 are 25 and 9 are 26. Now, in the periodic table, if you go look at your periodic table, you'll see that the number next to magnesium is not 24 or 25 or 26, it's 24.3. Why is there no peak in our mass spectrum at 24.3? So have a little think about that. So 24.3 is not the mass of an isotope, it's the weighted average of all the isotopes. Notice that 24.3 is closer to 24 than it is 25 or 26, so it's not just add up the three masses and divide by three. It's a weighted average, so there were 84 24s, so 84 lots of 24, 7 lots of 25, and 9 lots of 26 to average. So we're actually averaging 100 um, isotopes of magnesium, and a lot more of them um, had a mass of 24, so it's close to 24. So it's just another little recap of something that we came across before. Why must our sample be ionised? See if you can remember why your sample So why must our sample be ionised? It needs to be ionised so it could be accelerated and it needs to be ionised so it could be detected. Remember it's accelerated by an electric field, a negative and a positive plate and it's detected by an ion current detector where electrons are removed from the detector. So it must be ionised for those two processes. And then what else can we tell from this? Looking at it, can you remember which of these ions, the 24, the 25, or the 26, would reach the detector first? So remember, the lighter ions travel the fastest. So the ion that would reach the detector first would be the lightest one, 24, and then it's magnesium. Now, a lot of people would write that, and then they would lose a mark in their exam because it says the symbol of the ion. And the iron in a mass spectrometer, the iron that hits the detector is the magnesium positive iron, and then at the detector it turns back into magnesium. So 
So what can we do with this sort of information from this kind of spectrum? The first thing and the most important thing is we're going to calculate relative um, atomic masses from these relative isotopic masses. So it's a couple of key definitions. Relative isotopic mass, the mass of an isotope relative to 1 12th the mass of an atom of carbon 12, and relative atomic, uh, sorry, relative Yes, atomic mass, which is given the symbol AR, which is the weighted average relative to carbon-12. Okay, and this number is the number that we're going to find in the periodic table. How do we calculate it then? So we're going to calculate it by doing this calculation, which this sigma, there's a Greek letter here, this sigma means sum of add up the mass times the abundance of each isotope and divide by the total abundance. So when we're doing a question like this, we're going to say AR, we're going to look at our table. So instead of giving us the graph here, so easier to use, they've given us the data in a table. I'm going to look at it and I'm going to say, oh, there's three data points there. So there are three isotopes. So I am going to have three brackets that I'm going to add up because there's three isotopes. Remember it's mass times abundance. So the mass is 32 and the abundance is 95.02. The mass is 33 and the abundance is 0.76. The mass is 34 and the abundance is 4.22. So mass times abundance and add it all up. The sum of the mass times the abundance divided by the total abundance. Now, given that these are percentages, I don't even need to add those up to know that it's going to be 100. Pause the video, type that into your calculator and work out an answer. So this is what my calculator's reading, but I'm going to go back and I'm going to check the question. It says appropriate number of decimal places. Now, I'm not going to use isotopic mass to work that out because isotopic mass is number of protons plus neutrons. It's always a whole number. I'm going to use this. The decimal place is here, and so there are two, so I'm going to round this to two decimal places, 32.092 dp. So have a look at this page and have a go at this chlorine question. So the information is on the spectrum this time. We've got a relative abundance of three and one. See if you can calculate the AR. Now, they've been given as 3 and 1. You could, if you like, convert those to percentages and say it was 75% and 25% if you're confident. Um, but if not, it's an abundance of 3 and abundance of 1. And so, therefore, the total abundance is 4. So, we've got 35 3 times and 37 1 time shared out between the four isotopes. 35.5 is the number we should see in the periodic table. Right, now we've got an alloy of two metals. We need to identify the two metals. So it's an alloy of two metals. So I'm going to think, well, this and this, these probably belong to the same metal and are different isotopes. And this one is a different metal. I'm going to use my periodic table um, to explain which two metals we've got. So get your periodic table out, see if you can figure out which metals you've got. So there you go, we've got this PCAT 55, which is due to manganese, and then we've got two peaks at 63 and 65. Now if you've looked at your periodic table and you've thought maybe it's zinc, the reason it can't be zinc is because the relative atomic mass in the periodic table for zinc is 65.4, so it's bigger than 65, we'd have to have a peak higher than 65. So it's 63 and 65, and therefore, on average, it's somewhere in the region of 63 and a bit, or close to 64, and so it's copper. There's three peaks, because although there's only one isotope of manganese, there's two isotopes of copper. If you want a little extension activity, could you work out the relative atomic mass of copper from these percentages um, and their masses? So if you want to have a go at that, pause the video, I'll pop the answer up. It is a little extension activity. Have a go at working out the relative atomic mass of copper. And if you've had a go at that, 
what you just have to watch out for is that the bottom number there is actually 86 and not 100 because we're not counting the manganese, we're averaging the copper isotopes. The last one is a little bit of a rearrangement one because we've got the answer. 6.9 is the sum, uh, the weighted average of the mass, 6, of lithium, which we don't know the percentage abundance of, so let's call it an X, and 7, which we don't know the abundance of, let's call it a Y. Now, if their percentages will be dividing by 100. Now, you think, well, I've got two unknowns there. I can't possibly work out the values, but you can, because what we also know is that the percentage abundances of the two isotopes must add up to 100. So you can replace one of these. You could say that X is 100 <coughs> minus Y and substitute that in. So you could have 6.9 equals 6 brackets 100 minus y plus 7y over 100 and then do the algebra. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 100. I'm going to get 690, 690 and I'm going to expand my bracket. 6 times 100 is 600. 6 times minus y is minus 6y plus 7y. So 690 equals 600 minus 6y plus 7y. If I bring these two together, minus 6y and 7y, I'm going to get 1y. And if I take 600 away from each other, each side, I'm going to get 90 equals y. And if that is our percentage of, for y was our 7li. If that's our percentage of 7, lithium, then 10 must be equal to x, which is our percentage of lithium 6. So it was 10% and 90%. So that's relative atomic mass from mass spectrometry, and it's looking at mass spectrum and understanding what information we can gain from it.